You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. Once again, thank you guys for joining us. As you do each and every week, I want to remind you guys our deal with Amazon is just flat out amazing. Not only can you guys do your shopping, but you're also helping out some great veterans organizations. Here's all you got to do. Go to our website, hazardground.com, and click on the Amazon banner. Then do your normal Amazon shopping, whatever it is you need, whether it's just stuff around the house, stuff for your business, gifts, whatever it is. Once you complete your purchase, we get a kickback from Amazon on that purchase, and we donate it directly to one of the great foundations that you've heard here on the Hazard Ground podcast. So you'll be helping out great organizations like Mission Memorial Day, the Greatest Generations Foundation, Merging Vets and Players, the Shadow Warrior Foundation, the Pat Tillman Foundation, 22 Kill, and Fight or Die. So go to HazardGround.com. Again, click on the Amazon banner next time you do your Amazon shopping. It's a simple and easy way to give back to veterans everywhere and be part of the Hazard Ground community. Speaking of the Hazard Ground community, make sure you guys get on iTunes, leave us a rating and a review. Those help out so much. Not only do they let us know what you think about the show, but they also grow this podcast and let more people hear about these great, amazing stories that veterans everywhere are doing. want to remind you that this week's episode is brought to you by our new sponsor, Knife Country USA. Knife Country USA is the largest selection of knives, cutlery, and accessories on the internet. With over 30,000 models from over 500 manufacturers, Knife Country USA is confident confident that they have the perfect item for you. In addition to a tremendous selection, no other company can beat Knife Country USA's commitment to exceptional customer service. The owner of Knife Country USA personally guarantees he'll do whatever necessary to make sure you're 100% satisfied with your Knife Country USA purchase. And now Hazard Ground listeners get a deal. A special discount on all Knife Country USA purchases. Just go to our website again, hazardground.com. Click on the Knife Country USA banner on our sponsors page. Enter the coupon code HAZARD1 at checkout and get 15% off your entire order. That's HAZARD1 coupon code at checkout to get 15% your entire order when you click on the Knife Country USA banner on the Hazard Ground sponsors homepage. Final time, Hazard, the number one in the coupon code. Now, on to this week's episode. This week's guest has such an incredible story. Not many people get a second chance at life, but that's exactly what this week's guest got. He is a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, went on to deploy to Iraq where he was actually shot by a sniper and died for a full 15 minutes before he was brought back to life by a military trauma team. He went on to go to a second deployment in Iraq and then started the company after the fact called Asymmetric Mind. And his story is chronicled in a best-selling book called The Beauty of a Darker Soul. He is Josh Mance here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Josh, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me on. Great to be here. Unreal, man. Like, uh, just first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for being alive. Like, thank you for literally physically being here with me um, to be able to tell this because, you know, there's so much to unpack and so much to get through with the whole thing. And uh, we always like to start back at the beginning, why you got into the military and how you got into West Point. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's uh, I've got the medical team to thank for being alive, man. Uh, You know, they they just. They just. Pulled off a miracle and and uh, never quit and and that's that's the bottom line of this this whole experience. I was I'm only here today thanks to a mosaic of well led teams and well led people uh, who chose uh, to take action in the face of adversity. So uh, Amen. that's something that's that's within all of us, right? Um, but yeah, basically, you know, I I, I grew up in uh, Sunbury, Pennsylvania, a, a small town in northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, was was really raised uh, surrounded by people in the in the military and law enforcement professions and it was was really kind of locked on to going to West Point by the time I was 12 years old um, so so very fortunate uh, upbringing in in, in that sense um, got into West Point and uh, started in 2001 uh, and and sure enough just a couple months into that that first year, uh, September 11th happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, from from that point forward, we knew that uh, we'd be charged with the responsibility of leading men and women in combat. So when you decided to go to West Point, as you mentioned, it's before 9-11, was it just the impetus that you had service people in your family? You had, as you said, mentioned military law enforcement. I mean, you didn't want to do the regular college route and do ROTC and try it out. You went for the full-on commitment. 
Yeah, you, you know, I, I uh, was was heavily influenced by my my stepfather, one who was both a, a former infantry officer and also a police detective. Uh, and and second, uh, probably the 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 biggest influence in high school was actually one of my high school instructors, uh, who happened to be a retired special forces sergeant major, and uh, was running the junior ROTC program uh, at our school. So he kind of took me under his wing because uh, he knew I was sort of gravitating towards the military. And it's it's thanks to all of their influence that, um, you know, I was kind of lured to the academy. I wanted to be a good student. I wanted to be an athlete. And I liked the idea of going into the military. So the, the one place where I could do all three of those was West Point. You were a freshman or a plebe, as they call it, um... When you uh, when when nine eleven happened, I, I mean, were you guys really fully comprehending at that point in time what was going on in the world and what your future was? Yeah, you know, obviously nine eleven shook the foundation of of the country, right of the of the world in many respects. Uh, and at, you know, at, at at West Point, the 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 distinction there was that. You know, here we here we were on this four year journey to to come out as commissioned officers and come out with a with a degree, uh, and suddenly that got very real mm-hmm. uh, for us in terms of what that commission would actually mean. You know, and and what I would say is, uh, it's 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 almost as if a new level of seriousness uh, set in across the Corps of Cadets, and that became very apparent in the coming months as the war on terror kicked off. Uh, every couple of weeks, we'd hear an announcement of another recently graduated cadet who lost his life in combat. Um, so the the reality of that situation couldn't have been more present for us. Uh, and I'd also say the as difficult as the academy is to to get through, just from an academic standpoint, a physical standpoint, the hardest thing for for many of us, and and, and definitely including myself, was was just staying at the academy. Um, there is an enormous sense of, of, of guilt, uh, of, of not being downrange, not being, uh, part of the main effort, so to speak. Uh, and it was very difficult being trapped for lack of a better word in an academic environment, uh, and having to wait four years to do that. So, so some of my classmates actually, uh, dropped out of the academy. To I was going to ask you that. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, how were you? You're 19, 18, 19 years old, like realizing when you see that some guy you just saw walk in the hallways or walk in the campus is now dead in combat. Like that's got to be unnerving to say, hey, maybe I should rethink this. Uh, every day, that was, <laughs> uh, that was my biggest internal battle. And if it wasn't for the uh, honestly, what really saved me there was was, again, my my stepfather's guidance uh, and the guidance of Sergeant Major Doug Vanderpool, my old high school instructor. Um they are the ones who encouraged me to kind of um, stick with what I was receiving at the academy, right? To, 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 to focus on that internal development with the understanding that you would come back as a better prepared leader when the time called, right? It, and it, it was, had it not been for their mentorship, I would have <laughs> dropped out and enlisted in a heartbeat. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you. My, one of my best friends from high school, uh, and he was smarter than me. He was stronger than me. He, he was uh, just a very well-rounded individual. And, and, you know, he made the decision to enlist instead of uh, going to the academy. And he very well could have. Um, he was killed during my senior year at West Point while I was working on a history report. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just things like that that, just continue to rivet you over and over and over again. But um, ultimately, things turned out. I think exactly the way that they were supposed to. Uh, I'm fortunate that I stuck with it, and uh, well, you know, wouldn't wouldn't change a thing retrospectively. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, you know, I don't know a lot of people who went to West Point and they value the experience and they cherish everything that they got there and. You know, they always say without it, uh, their life would be dramatically different, uh, not only from the lessons that they learned, but the people that they've met and the network that they've created through, um, you know, West Point is, is something that, uh, you know, everybody just holds on to very tightly who walk that campus and walk through those halls. So I'm sure it's still serving you well today. 
All right, so let's get to uh, right before graduation or when you find out what your first assignment is going to be, what your branch is, and, and, and all that. So how quickly do we get you from graduation in 2005 to a unit that's deploying? Uh, roughly about a year. Uh, and, and, and that, that was really consumed by about a year of, of school, uh, the infantry officer yeah. basic course at Fort Benning. Uh, and then shortly after that, I met my, my platoon, uh, out of Fort Hood, Texas with the first cavalry division. Uh, and you know, within a year and a half of graduating from West Point, we were on our way to the middle East. Wow. That's, uh, that's it, amazing. It seems fast, but it felt like an eternity. <laughs> I, well, I, I, right? I guess, it, as you said, you're doing a lot of schooling at that point in time. You know, your, your officer basic course, or they call it Bolick now, Josh. They've changed all the names on us. Yeah. Um, but uh, regardless, you know, you go through uh, all that schooling, and it just seems to drag on forever. Um, and, and, and shout out to the first cab. You and I both spent time at Fort Hood. But um, uh, so when you get to your unit and you get to – uh, find out that you're deploying to Iraq. What were you told and what was your mission going to be? Did you know where you were going? All that stuff. That That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, the, the, the as you know, the, the, the perception of what most people think of as combat is it, 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 it still consumed with this imagery of like World War II conventional style fighting, yep. <laughs> right? Yeah. Force on force. If they only knew. And, and Yep. And, and, and certainly the, the dynamic of the modern operating environment is drastically different, right? It, it is t today and, and, and likely will be for the rest of our lifetimes. Uh, today, we, we have to maintain our tactical expertise. We, we have to be able to turn that on in a heartbeat if needed. But the center of gravity of success rests with our ability to build relationships with the local population, mm -hmm. to build their trust, right? And uh, that was that shift to asymmetric warfare, specifically to counterinsurgency uh, in Baghdad was really just starting to happen uh, in the open, if you will, around the 2006 timeframe. Uh, so we were walking in uh, to an environment, this thing called counterinsurgency, which we really didn't, w w which most people really didn't fully comprehend what it was, why we were doing it. Um, we were trained as a conventional force, yet when we got over there, the situation was dynamically different. Um, so again, I, <laughs> being very fortunate by the way I was raised by a special forces sergeant major, um, I was fortunate to have studied uh, counterinsurgency doctrine from like the 1960s communist era uh, on top of majoring in the Arabic language at, at West Point and, and having a really robust cultural understanding. Uh, so all of that stuff kind of led to uh, the environment in Baghdad where, you know, I, I, the ability to speak the language directly to the people instead of through an interpreter uh, was a more powerful weapon than, than, than the rifle that I carry. Yeah, by the way, what the hell was that all about? Who wants to major in Arabic language? I mean, that's an odd choice for an 18 year old, 19 year old. Well, you know, I, I, um, again, going back to high school here, I, I, it was really the, the influence of how I was raised. Uh, you know, one thing that Sergeant Major Doug Vanderpool taught me, uh, and, and, and really sunk in was never underestimate the capacity of the human spirit regardless of where we go in the world, uh, that, that regardless of resources, regardless of the situation, that human spirit still remains, right? And w when you're dealing with different languages and different cultures, uh, our, our capacity to make a human-to-human -human connection, right, to build trust, to empathize, to display humility, uh, w when those relationships are formed, they essentially serve as combat multipliers yes. in that environment. So I, I, I knew that obviously I'd be an infantryman on the ground interacting with the people. And, and I just intuitively knew the, the, the importance of the Arabic language as it would be. And certainly that turned out to be true. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, credit to you. I mean, history would have been fine for me. Uh, I didn't need to do all the Arabic, but to your point, you know, when I deployed the first time, um, and, and I did counterinsurgency. I had an interpreter. I can recall, 
I was in a meeting as I was working side by side with with Iraqi soldiers, um, and it got to a point where I had, you know, paid attention enough to the Arabic language that. You know, my interpreter, when he would say certain things, I would just be able to pick up on it and be able to repeat it just from, you know, being immersed in the culture and being around him so much. And I remember at the end of one meeting, I explained to them fully in Arabic, having no Arabic training, where I wanted them to be, what building it was, what time, what day of the week and everything else. And I said it all and everybody's eyes like bugged out of their head. And my interpreter <laughs> stood up and said, OK, sir, I'm no longer needed here. I'm going to go home now. And everybody got a big laugh out of it. But it was that kind of connection I made with all of my soldiers, my Iraqi soldiers, that allowed us to work so effectively together. And as you called it, it's a combat multiplier. Without that, that interpersonal experience, uh, you'll, you'll never be able to trust the people you're working beside, whether they're American or, or Iraqi. Right. I couldn't agree with you more. So and, uh, it, that's, imp- that's imp- it's, it's amazing what you're able to pick up over there on the fly. <laughs> well, right? if you but, want to, if you give a rip enough about it, you know, like that's really the big thing. If, if you make it a point to understand it. And you know, what, you know what it all starts from, Josh, is empathy. You know, I mean, it's, yep. it's easy for us to sit as a, and I don't mean to condescend to Americans, but it's easy for us to sit on our high horse and look down on the rest of the world because we've done so for so long and we've kind of earned that position to be the ones in power. But that, 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 that power distance, that empathy that, that grows with the, the, that gap, you know, the more power you have, the less empathetic you are to the people at the bottom of the food chain. And so it's a concerted effort to make sure that you express that and get down at their level, uh, and, and, and that's how you create those relationships. I, I couldn't agree with you more. That was very well said. Um, empathy is the foundation of successful counterinsurgency. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Um, it's the foundation of leadership. It's the foundation of, of anything that involves building relationships ultimately comes down to empathy and trust, right? Mm-hmm. And, and w- w- what we can have a tendency to do, right, is when we're dealing with countries that are across oceans and thousands, thousands of miles away with different cultures and different languages and different moral and ethical norms, um, it's, it's very easy to stay distant and to, and to keep those barriers up. Right. So, so making that conscious effort to, to, to break down the superficial barriers of culture and language, right. Allows us to get to the human aspect of people. Um, it, it, you know, uh, most people have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yep. Right. And, and if we, if we look at that pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy, right. Everywhere we go in the world, People, generally speaking, people are just people, right? And they're dominated by that same hierarchical structure of needs. And and w- what's interesting is, you know, h- here in the United States, we're very fortunate to – most of us have never lived in the absence of those lower layers of Maslow's hierarchy, you know, the physiological right. needs, food, sure. water, air, shelter. We've at least <clears> – <throat> excuse me. We've at least grown up with a – roof over our heads. We've had an adequate amount to eat. You know, we have, we have clean water to drink, but it's hard for us to, to understand, uh, like a country like Iraq, a war torn country like Iraq or Afghanistan, like all government systems are destroyed. (laughs) You know, they're fighting to find water. They're fighting to find food. They're living in the absence of that hierarchy. Right. And, and this is where it really gets interesting. It's, it, it, it really gets complicated at this point because I, it, you know, we have to ask people if, if you can put yourself in their shoes, right? Imagine if the tables were turned and all government systems in the United States were suddenly destroyed and wiped out overnight, right? And, 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 and your own child was starving to death or dying of thirst. How far would you go in order to protect their life, <laughs> You know, and, and yeah. there's there's a lot of moral and ethical uh, challenges that emerge in, in an environment like that. Um, so it, it, it does take an enormous amount of empathy to really discern um, insurgents from, you know, the local population and, and, and people who are just trying to live normal lives. And you talk about the, the distance in America. Now, our biggest problem is whether the Wi-Fi works or not. So uh, put right. that put that into perspective. Okay, so you're on the ground in Baghdad. Um, you know, prior to to your injury, I, I want to ask you about if you lost any guys or had anybody wounded, because I want to know the difference of what goes through your mind 
as a cadet at West Point, hearing that a, a fellow classmate or somebody you knew was killed over there, and then when it happens when you're standing on the ground over there. Right. Well, it, you know, it, it, the... The area of Baghdad that we were in was was particularly violent uh, in, in in northeastern Baghdad. Um, it was it was really kind of the center of gravity of Iraq at that specific time. Was it Saudi? Uh, uh, we we were on the border of Saudi. Okay, City, right. So so you're you're right in the same area there. Um, so the reality of that situation sunk in very quick. Uh, you know, in in, in terms of uh, I didn't personally lose any men on, on my team. Uh, we did as part of the battalion within the first week we were there. Uh, we were getting hit with mortar rounds, uh, with roadside bombs, with, uh, you know, seeing uh, just a, a variety of different ta- attacks. Everything that we heard of uh, suddenly came to fruition. And uh, the fragility of life uh, really, really started to emerge. Um, What's interesting about that from a psychological standpoint, right, is, you know, something that many veterans struggle with when they uh, return from deployment is emotional withdrawal, right? And that many, including myself, tended to feel very emotionally numb after the deployment. And when we're exposed to repeated attacks like that, right, just to, to, to repeated uh, chronically traumatic events, uh, we have to learn how to shut off emotion, not only to survive, but to thrive inside of those environments. Uh, so within a couple months, it, it, it's, it's almost like uh, it's almost like psychologically being larger than life or death at, at, at one point where, where, where death is no longer feared. Right. And, and with that, there's almost a sense of freedom that comes with it. Um but in the same breath, the reality of those attacks, uh, you know, when, when, when you're hit by a roadside bomb and it throws a 20 ton vehicle across the road, like it's, like it's a feather. Um, it, 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 it definitely changes the perspective of reality. Well, and, and you hit it on the head and we've touched on this topic a bunch on the podcast. It's a dangerous place to be when the loss of life is a numbing thing, right? Because right. You, you, you lose the ability to value life in and of itself. And, and that is more dangerous for a soldier with a weapon than a lot of things, not only to themselves and the people around them, but as crazy as it sounds it, it, to the enemy. This is why we have stories about things that go on like Abu Ghraib, and we have stories about war crimes and things of that nature because there are people who have so little respect for life in and of itself when you, when you are around so much depravity and so much evil and so much loss of life that it, that it, it doesn't affect you, and, and that changes who you are at your core, and that's a very, very dangerous spot to be. Right. So, I mean, you well, know, there's a lot there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're, you're, so the, 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 the mechanisms and the, uh, the, 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 the emotions that we learn to harness in an environment like that uh, are, are – are appropriate for that environment, right? For that war turn environment. When we when we return, right, to a to a stable environment, those extreme emotions that that maybe were necessary to employ over there aren't necessarily valued by society back here, right? And it it it, it takes an enormous uh, degree of emotional intelligence, uh, emotional bandwidth. In order to fully process what those emotions mean and be able to harness them and and, and apply them back here, so, so there, there's there's an enormous adjustment that takes place between these two different worlds, uh, that is just something we're we're barely starting to scratch the surface uh, of how to help people manage. No, and, and it is it's, it's transition and decompression are, are are two things that we don't focus on enough in the veteran community. We we leave a lot of soldiers to their own uh, devices, if you will, to try to. Uh, figure that part out without a lot of help, and it and it it ends up taking more lives than anything else. And it's it's extremely sad. But as you said, we're beginning to s- start to scratch the surface of it. So um, there is a little bit a little bit of glimmer of hope going there. All right, let's get back to your deployment and April twenty first, two thousand seven. 
Um, tell me about the beginning of this day. Uh, was it a normal day, what your job was, what you were doing? And take me through the events leading up to, um, obviously, what happens when you get hit by the sniper fire. Sure. Um, so to kind of set the context for this, uh, again, largely because of our Arabic-speaking ability, uh, my platoon was was paired with the local Iraqi police <clears throat> group, right? And and that Iraqi police organization, yeah, you know, here, here's another key distinction, right? That that back here in in the United States, we 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 are blessed to have a very stable police force, right? A a, a police force that is respected, that's admired, that is backed by a robust legal system and 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 whatnot. In Iraq, right, that, that 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 police structure is is nothing like that, right? The, the the police over there maybe wore wore uniforms at that time, but that's about the extent of their authority. Right. Um, they they were not respected. There was no really robust legal system. Uh, it was it was infiltrated and it was corrupt. Uh, they were not trained, right? So so we were really starting from ground zero. Um, and what happened on April 21st is I had been shaping this with the Iraqi police chief for quite some time, but I actually got him to agree to go on a joint patrol with us for, for the first time. Right. It was very important at that time that the, uh, police forces kind of took the lead on operations so that the public could see. Uh, that they were actually taking action and start to b- build that respect level up for the Iraqi police force. Uh, so, so this was, this was a big day. It, it was the first day that, that we were able to actually conduct a joint humanitarian mission uh, with the Iraqi police. So we uh, drove up to this area. Uh, we did a successful humanitarian drop of school supplies and, and clothing. And during the middle of that mission, uh, my scout team got diverted to another part of the sector uh, to go investigate a recent attack by a rocket propelled grenade. Uh, nobody was injured in that attack, but we had to go see if we could basically determine who was responsible for it. Uh, and and bottom line is when we when we reached that point um, and and reached that other part of the sector, <clears throat> we were basically drawn into a complex ambush by a very very skilled. Uh, team of militia members that that I, I believe was uh, we believe was was pr- probably came in outside uh, of uh, Iraq, <laughs> just because of the high degree of professionalism that they showed. Um, but in short, as uh, myself and my senior non commissioned officer were um, testing uh, one of the drivers for explosives, we were essentially fixed in position. And during that time, we were engaged by an enemy sniper. Uh, And that bullet uh, first severed Marlin's aorta and then exited out of his chest, ricocheted into my thigh and severed my thermal artery. Oh, wow. And and that that really that really sets the conditions for uh, for this near death experience. Uh, uh, Not to be callous, but that like literally is a double kill shot. Those are the two worst arteries you can hit like. Aorta and femoral, like you, you can't. Other than the carotid, you can't do much better than that. Well, <clears throat> this was uh, a very high caliber bullet. Uh, it was larger than a fifty caliber weapon. Wow! Uh, so it was, it was the, it, it was actually, I believe, to be an anti aircraft weapon that was converted into a sniper rifle. Uh, and to our knowledge, it was the first time we we've seen a caliber. Uh, of that size used on dismounted troops, uh, which kind of for us was another indication that this attack was a, an outside attack. Right. Now, did, but, did the uh, bullet stay lodged in your leg or no? It did. Okay. Uh, now, I mean, so remember, I wouldn't have a leg uh, if that bullet hit my leg first, right? Uh, basically, uh, because it went through Marlon's chest, it, it slowed it down enough and then basically fused to his armor plate. So, so the chunk of metal that hit me was more like a, a mangled piece of metal, the size of a fist that, that blew out my femoral artery in my thigh, um, basically went down to the bone and remained lodged. I mean, that, that's just, I'm trying to put this in like, so it went through because we wear plates of armor in the front and the back. 
right? So yep. it went through a, a, a plate of armor in this front, through his entire chest cavity, a plate of armor out the back, and then went through your leg. Essentially, yes. That is unfreaking uh, real. And a third piece actually broke off and hit one of my interpreters, which I found out later. Uh, just a minor injury there, but but yeah, this this was a massive, massive bullet. So uh, Marlin's killed instantly. Uh, almost. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so so <clears throat> you know, as many of combat veterans, police, fire, um, have have maybe experienced similar situations to this or, or, or close enough to, to experience the physiological effects of it. Uh, you know, but, but in firefights and combat and in, in, in active situations like this, our physiology completely changes, right? The, sure. the, 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 the limbic system <laughs> takes over uh, within our brains, right? And our bodies shut down everything that it doesn't need in order to survive. Um, so, so I saw this, in, in this, this, incredible progression of physiological symptoms from the time I was shot to the time that I flatlined about 30 minutes later. And it started right as, um, this mix of slow motion time, fast motion time and auditory distortion, right. And in that I could only hear the muted shot of the sniper rifle and my own voice calling for a medic. Right. Um, I, I, I could watch Marlon fall to the ground in slow motion. And as his body hit the ground, uh, you know, I instinctively started to drag him uh, to a safe location and started to render medical assistance to him uh, until I myself was overcome by blood loss and fell to the ground. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, e- even with. Uh, you know, with a blown up femoral, which I didn't even know I was shot at. I was going to ask you, after uh, he got hit, did you, what did it feel like? Did you know you were shot or was just the adrenaline of the moment o- overtaking everything? No, it, it was, I, I was, I was completely on automatic mode. Um, I, it, it, I, I knew something was wrong, uh, but I didn't know I was shot, certainly. Um, so, you know, instinctively, I was able to drag Marlon and, and, and do what I could until the medic arrived just a few seconds later. But, um, you know, w- w- with with so much blood loss, I, I, I fell to the ground. I, I didn't completely pass out at that point, uh, which is <clears throat> pretty interesting. But I did start to – I felt like I was falling into a deeper and deeper sleep as my team was dragging me into the evacuation vehicle. Um and as I was falling asleep, right, I actually felt very peaceful, very calm. And I, this is one of the most profound moments of this whole experience. One of my team members noticed who was dragging me. Uh, one of my team members noticed that I was about to go unconscious. And suddenly he, he yelled at me at the top of his lungs and, and said, come on, sir, stay awake. And, and in, that, in that instant, in that moment – suddenly I could hear the emotional pain in his voice, right? I, I could hear the grunts and groans from the other members of the team. All of that stuff suddenly came back to my conscious awareness, right? And, and, and in that moment, I realized that I was still the leader of this team, right? That, that this experience wasn't just about me. This was about all of us, right? And, and that I had to do everything I possibly could to help lead them through this situation. Right. So, so it's like the power of human connection, right? The power of that love we have for each other was enough in that moment to snap me back to full consciousness, which is where the fight for my life really began. Um, so it, it was, um, that was kind of the first phase, if you will, of this whole thing. How much pain are you in at this point? None. None. Okay. No, Throughout the whole experience, I had uh, physically, physically, I had no pain. Um, the, the, my, it was, it, what was bizarre about it is my body was essentially in full blown shock, but my mind was crystal clear. Um, you know, I could, I could comprehend everything that, that people were saying to me along this process. I, I could, um, recall exactly where each member of the medical team was. Uh, who was working on me, I could tell you what they were doing. I wanted to listen to their instructions, but my body would react in a completely opposite manner. So in in a a sense, there was 
uh, almost a separation between mind and body throughout this experience, um, which is which is quite bizarre. <laughs> I'm just I'm, I'm 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 picturing the whole thing in my head because you're doing a fantastic job at creating it, but I'm just trying to. The, you know, the mental acuity at this point is off the charts, and that to me is astounding in and of itself. Uh, I mean, the fact that you can recall all this stuff with such clarity is, is, is it harrowing after all these years? Is it worse that you can recall it all? Do you wish that you almost it was a blur and you couldn't remember any of it? No, I'm actually, I'm actually uh, very grateful uh, that I can remember this experience. Uh, you know, and here's a couple of reasons why. <clears throat> You know, r- roughly, uh, we, we were, again, very fortunate to be close to a medical treatment facility. Uh, it, it was a very, uh, what I'll call a rogue treatment facility, very rudimentary medical equipment, uh, but a dynamite uh, U.S. Army <laughs> uh, surgical team, trauma unit, right, uh, equivalent, equivalent to an ER team here in the United States. And uh, this team was just incredibly well led by the brigade surgeon uh, named Dr. Dave de Blasio and a team of about of about 10 uh, of his members. And, and, you know, one thing that I remember uh, almost instantly uh, as I first got to the aid station was, was just the precision with which this team worked. Uh, everybody had a specific job. They worked as a cohesive team. Uh, watching them work was like watching a choreographed dance and, you know, kind of when you're fighting for your life and on the verge of death, th- their professionalism, uh, just gave me an enormous sense of comfort going through this experience. Right. And it was also important to understand, you know, from a leadership standpoint, right. And, you know, this, sometimes the combat arms professions have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the infantry folks are like, yeah, combat's all about us. Everybody here is to support us. Now, now look, I, I never adopted that mentality myself, but at the same time, I never disproved it more than on April 21st, 2007. Uh, Cause this medical team executed the most well-rehearsed battle drill that I've ever seen in my life. Um, so, so, you know, <clears throat> despite their best efforts though, I, I, I could feel myself starting to die. And what happens uh, when you're dying of blood loss is you're essentially suffocating, uh, because no oxygen is being delivered to the organs. Right. Right. And, and what the body instinctively does is it attempts to draw the remaining blood we have into our chest cavities in order to protect those vital organs. <clears throat> and I could actually feel that happening. Uh, the, the blood started to creep out of my legs and extremities. And as all the blood left, they cramped up and became numb. And then that blood creeping sensation moved through the thighs and they became numb. And, and when that feeling hit my stomach, it was the first point where I realized the injury was getting out of control. Um, Physically, at that point, it felt like I was running wind sprints around a track and, and couldn't stop. Right. And, and emotionally, uh, although life didn't flash before my eyes, I, I do believe that what was most important to me was revealed in those final moments. Which was right? what? And, and, uh, my mom and my two sisters. <laughs> I, I started to repeat those names instinctively over and over again uh, for about the last minute of my life. And uh, finally, when that, that blood creeping sensation hit my chest, I consciously knew that was it. I took my last breath. I said my last thought, and, and I died. Would you be willing to share your last thought with us? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'll tell you, in that moment, <clears throat> I, I, I said my first real prayer. Um, I, I, I simply said under my breath, please take care of them. Uh, and I was referring to my family members that I was, that I was just repeating over and over again in my mind. Right. So it was, please take care of them. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that at what happened after that, right. What happened with the very last breath, the, the precise transition point between life and death, 
and and that is a moment that I remember vividly. Um, you know, I get the question a lot: Did you have an out of body experience? You know, what happened during those fifteen minutes? Uh, I don't know. I, I have not been able to recall what happened <laughs> during those fifteen minutes to this day. <laughs> I, I but, say but, this tongue in cheek. Yeah, you were dead. There, there's no recalling anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, like like physically, your body is not working, so you there's nothing to recall. <laughs> Right. Well, potentially, you know, it, it gets, uh, it gets interesting. You know, I'm, I'm, I study, you know, I'm, I'm in a, a grad school program right now studying consciousness and, you know, it makes sense for the dead guy to study consciousness, but right. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there. Right. What, what I will say though is, is what I did experience, I think was, was even more powerful because, because I was conscious for it. Right. And, and this is that, pers- that, that, that last breath, what happened there. Right. And, and the only way I can describe that feeling is uh, one of absolute and complete surrender to something much greater than ourselves, uh, however we choose to define what that is. Right. Um, and, and and it was as if this is this is difficult to comprehend, right? But, but it's as if every good, every bad, every positive, negative, doubt, hope, um, everything just vanished. And, and it's as if the spirit becomes part of everything and nothing at the same time. Uh, so, so the moment of my death was the most peaceful experience of my life. Uh, In a strange way, that makes sense. Well, you know, it, it, here's where, here's where it, uh, kind of the challenge comes in, right? It is the experience of dying wasn't hard, <laughs> right? It, it, <laughs> as I just said, it was, it was, it was in the end, it was a very peaceful, uh, experience. W- what wasn't peaceful was the, the decade long journey afterwards to d- try to derive meaning in that sure, experience. Yeah. Right. And, and this is, uh, you know, one thing that I'm adamant about, right. Is, is that psychological trauma does not discriminate. No. You know, um, it comes in many shapes and forms. It, it, trauma impacts all of us from every walk of life. Uh, and, and even though the nature of our experiences can be very different, the, the emotions that manifest from them can be very similar, right? Especially when we look at them through the lens of guilt and shame and, and other deep morally based emotions. Um, as we look at traumatic experiences in general, Right, especially experiences of a very high magnitude, right? Something that, something that we might be able to refer to here as peak ex- peak experiences. Um, the challenge with peak experiences, right, it, it isn't necessarily surviving the experience itself, right? It's our ability to integrate its meaning into who we are now, right? To assimilate its meaning, and. and you know, trauma is known for leaving us essentially trapped in our past constructs of the world, right? And, and the, the the real journey, right? The real the real um, the most heroic journey that we'll ever take, right, is the journey inside of ourselves, right? The the, the journey to uncover the truth uh, about ourselves, about the meaning. And, and to be able to take that and transcend uh, into into who we are now, right into into the present moment, uh, that 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 is that is one of the greatest challenges in overcoming trauma, right? From, from trauma to transformation, all right? It's it, the the journey in between is what really matters, right? And, yeah. and, and that's that's what we have agency over, right? That's what we have the ability to to try to control with the right perspective. Before we get to the trauma that you dealt with after the fact, go back to that moment when you finally wake back up, because that's, I mean, you know, that, that is, uh, it's unassuming, right? Cause you're like, I don't really know what happened. So do you remember waking up and, and who was there and what you were told and everything else? Yep. <laughs> so I, I was, uh, so I regained consciousness roughly two days later. Um, I was in the green zone at the time. Okay. And I, I, I learned um, some very harrowing, incredible details of, of, of what happened. Uh, some of these were told to me in the moment. Some of them emerged, you know, in the years that followed. 
uh, you know, progressively getting more and more detail. But I, I really learned what happened during that 15 minutes that I was out and the extent of it that the medical team went to save my life. So we, 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 we already mentioned that I was evacuated initially to a very uh, rogue treatment facility, right? Very rudimentary equipment. And they were essentially working on me on a cot, right? And, and because of a mechanical failure of the cot, they were unable to lower it to the proper height to get the leverage to do CPR. And it just so happened that the one person that could reach me, right, happened to be a former football lineman who was 19 years old, weighed about 260 pounds and was six foot six. Um, and that one individual is the person who did CPR on me the entire 15 minutes uh, straight. Now, now that's significant. Um, anyone who's ever done CPR on a live victim, I don't care what kind of physical condition you're in. It's exhausting. After about three, yep. Yeah, after about it's... three minutes, <laughs> right? Most people would be would be just physically exhausted. And uh, you know, I was told he was just pouring sweat the whole time, never quit, never gave up, and he did it standing on a crate, <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> The other thing that happened, uh, the defibrillator paddles that they used to shock me back to life, right? They literally arrived at the base that very morning. Oh, they they didn't God. they didn't have them before, oh. right? So they they had to use them. They had to take them out of the plastic to use them on divine intervention. Yep, you know, I, I, and then these other inspirational details emerged, like I, you know, somehow this medical team pulls off this miracle, right? They get a faint pulse back. And they rushed me out to the landing zone where they had a Black Hawk helicopter running hot to take me to the green zone for advanced surgery, right? And obviously, I wasn't conscious at this point. But as the medical team was rushing me out of that on that cot, they were greeted by my scout platoon, right? And and the leader of that platoon at the time, one of the sergeants, stopped the medical team and said, "He's our lieutenant. We're putting him on that bird." Uh, and they, they took the stretcher, they put him on the bird, and with that, they took control back of a situation that a sniper stole from them just a few minutes prior. I, the, the, I, that, that still gives me chills thinking about it. Um, you know, and in the green zone, the, the, you know, the surgeon conducted a perfect vascular surgery the first time out the gate. Uh, they administered nearly 30 units of blood to save my life. Um, and because there was a blood shortage at the time, they were literally taking service members off the base, taking blood straight out of their arm and doing a direct transfusion into me. Oh, wow. So it's like every step of this medical evacuation process from the initial medic on the ground who cinched up that tourniquet to the nurse back at Walter Reed Army Medical Center was was flawless. And, and, and truly, I am only alive thanks to a mosaic of people who chose – right? To take action in the face of adversity. When do you meet that 6'6", 260 pound former lineman who did CPR <laughs> for 15 minutes? When's the first time you meet him? About four and a half months later. Uh, so I, I actually went back to Baghdad. Yeah. You're uh, a sick man. You know that? Well, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I went back, um, uh, I think I hit the ground. I, I made it back about four and a half months later, uh, we, which was, which was on the verge of impossible. Um, I, I did that voluntarily and no one, no one forced me to go back. And in fact, every single person recommended against it. Uh, and I had to pull a lot of strings to make it happen. Um, you know, I was pulling staples out of my leg with a leather man. I was, oh, you're, <laughs> I was oh, you know, running, you know, limping uh, around the track on crutches and started jogging. It, it was, you know, I had to pull stuff out of my medical records. It, it was, it was almost this, um, it, it, it was a slight form of insanity if, in, in, in many ways. The question is why, right? What, what, well, what, that's, what, that's a, there's a healing there, right? Like you wanting to get back on ground. There, there there's, there's a, a connectivity to it. There's a sort of closing of the loop. There, there, I mean, I get why you wanted to. Like, p part of me understands the insanity of wanting to get back there, um, but just the, the, you know, it, it's one thing to do it a year later, two years later, and everything else. To do it four months later is maniacal. Well, right. You know, and and, and frankly, I agree with you. You know, because here's the thing, right? We can 
and, and this really leads into uh, maybe the, a, a slightly different part of this discussion in terms of the psychological trauma and its effects, right? Back then, right, back in 2007, as I was laying in that hospital, right, I had this insatiable drive to get back to my team. Now, I, I, I believed initially that that was coming for two reasons, right? The, the, the first reason was I needed to get back to my men, right? I, I, I knew that they needed leadership and I knew they needed a morale boost more than anything else. Uh, they didn't have a replacement for us at that time. Uh, so, so this left a, um, you know, group of young staff sergeants who were extremely uh, exceptional leaders, right? But, but they, they were left with the responsibility of running that platoon and was arguably the most chaotic area uh, of, of Baghdad during one of the most violent periods of the war. Um, so, so that was certainly the primary thing driving me, or so I thought. And the, the second thing was more on a personal basis. Uh, I, I needed to prove to myself that I could get back on the horse and, and still perform my job as an infantry officer. And, and I, I thought that those were the two primary reasons driving me. I didn't understand until almost a decade later the true source of what was driving me to do what I did. And that was really grounded in guilt. Um, <clears throat> not necessarily in the form of survivor's guilt in that Marlon Harper died and I lived, as so many thought, including myself for a long time. But remember, guilt is extremely complex emotion, extremely complicated and very easy uh, to miss the root cause of it. What I've uncovered is a, a, a different form of guilt, right? And let's use this as an example, right? The, the, the medical evacuation flight, right, that, that flew me from Germany back to Walter Reed Army Medical Center, it, it's not like every minute on that flight was a minute closer to home. It was a minute farther away from my team. Yep. Right. And, and when I, when I was in the hospital, as bad as my injury was, right. I, I was one of the only ones in that entire hospital expected to make a full recovery. You know, Walter Reed is, is the largest military hospital. It's, it's where all the most severely wounded uh, service members are evacuated to to heal uh, physically, the care that I received there was phenomenal, but emotionally, uh, Walter Reed is a very difficult place to be because you're yeah. surrounded by amputees, burn victims. You're seeing the impacts that it has on your family. And the image that I will always remember is one day I was walking around a corner and I was on crutches. <clears throat> I looked around the corner and suddenly I saw this beautiful young girl in her early 20s pushing around her new double amputee fiance in a wheelchair and and it's an image that just riveted me so this this guilt that i was experiencing was a guilt in my ability to heal when other people couldn't right coupled with everything else that i just mentioned um and 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 that is a driving factor right that 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 really caused me to go back into a situation before I was probably before I was psychologically ready for it, right? Before I even really knew the scope or the impact of what this, the totality of these experiences had on me. Right. And it was, it was, a uh, it was a very convenient shield for quite some time. Right. And, and, you know, on the surface throughout the rest of my career, <clears throat> I was, I was a rock star, right, on the crew. I was all over media, TV. I was doing all this great stuff, right? I was briefing at all these great behavioral health conferences and interacting with clinicians. And, you know, on the surface, I, I looked uh, like the testament of what resilience should look like, right? Yet internally, I failed to recognize the symptoms of psychological trauma within myself and also fooled everybody else in the same process. And... Um, what, what's most dangerous about this is I didn't know it. I didn't know I was doing it. And um, my life started to collapse in, in different ways, um, very subtly, that ultimately led to, uh, you know, a, a series of suicidal spirals and, and um, other events that, that ultimately 
catalyze the true transformative process. Do you think, Josh, that if you hadn't rushed back, that some of those, you know, suicidal thoughts and things that you dealt with after the fact would have been different? I don't. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'm not one to uh, say should have, could have, would have. Uh, you know, the, the reality is we are who we are in this present moment and, and all of our experiences that, that we've uh, endured, overcome, sustained throughout our lives have led to the emergence of who we are right here, right now. And I'm grateful for all of them. Um, the, the challenge is what are we going to do now? <laughs> right. And, and the, the point is <clears throat> that regardless of whether I went back or not, at, at some point I would have had to face the truth. Right. At, at some point I would have had to gone through that transformative journey. Right. A, 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 in order to, to, to basically derive meaning from that experience and, and assimilate it to who I was now. And, uh, you know, that process, right? And I'd say, I'd say what really triggered um, the realization that, that really triggered a transformative process, uh, and this is actually quite recent, only about two years ago, is, is this realization that I had to learn to accept the death of my old self before I could fully live in the present moment, right? And I don't mean accept death in terms of this near-death experience, Right. I, I mean, in, in many ways, accept the death of who I was prior to those experiences uh, in order to appreciate who we are now. Right. I hope people listening can understand how difficult that is. I mean, you say it with such ease, but, you know, just in doing enough of these and talking to enough people, that process, um, you know, it's so easy for us to say, oh, my God, you must be so thankful to be alive and you must feel so all those things. But. You know, the disconnection from what happened before and to what happens after is so hard. Like you, you can't easily just walk into a new life and, and start it over and, and pretend like the past didn't happen. All that you drag all that with you, man. It, it, pr precisely. Um, <clears throat> that process, right? It, 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 you know, people think it takes a lot of courage to set foot on a battlefield and, and, uh, or it takes a lot of courage to get shot or, or, you know, it takes a lot of courage to go through all these, right. You know, I tell you hands down, like the most courage that any of us will ever display is the courage to go within ourselves, right. The, the, the courage to, to truly understand, uh, and appreciate the, the playing field, of emotion, right? The spectrum of emotions that we have experienced, uh, the spectrum of thoughts and mental processes that have went through our mind, right? And 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 to 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 learn how to understand that and adapt it uh, and harness it, <clears throat> so that we can uh, live in an optimal state right now, that that is a journey, right? It's 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 a it's a perpetual journey. Uh, it's never a fixed point in time. It is something that is constantly re renewing and constantly emerging. It requires us to be comfortable living in a state of ambiguity. Right? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, here's what I can't be empathetic about because I've never gone through it, but I, but I really want to be. The darkness of life versus the darkness of death, right? I mean, because you, you got to put those two things side by side. You, you, you've literally watched and felt your life end and, and you felt the darkness of death as it literally came knocking at your door. And, and you come back from that only to fall into the darkness of life and the depths of depression and everything else. And, and you know, it, it's crazy to say, but death almost seems, and, and this is why suicide is a way out for everybody, because it almost seems like that is easier than the darkness of the life that you're living. Well, it is. <laughs> I, I mean, it, 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 um, rock bottom first is, is, is that it is, it can feel like that, right? The, the real question then is, you know, here we're coming down to purpose and meaning of life, right? And, and, and this is, this is a central question, right? To, to, to overcoming experiences like this, you know, how, how, do, how does one reconcile the fact that, this the experience of death was peaceful 
the experience of life feels like torture yep. right, afterwards. And, I, you know, what I'd say is, is, is you know, I, I fall back on the words of Viktor Frankl here, who's a world-renowned psychiatrist yep. and Holocaust survivor. Right? Man's Search for Meaning. I've read the yep. book. Yep. Yep. And he's, well, you, you might recall, he said in that book, right, that without suffering and death, human life cannot be complete. To live is to suffer, and, to survive is to find meaning behind the suffering. Yep. And that the suffering we endure, right, it gives us ample opportunity to derive greater meaning in our lives. Right. So, so, so really, really what we're talking about here is it, it takes a lot of courage to accept the death of our old self and essentially transcend into a more complex form of consciousness, into a more heightened perspective of life, right? It requires us to, to have the courage and the strength to lean into adversity, to lean into discomfort, to embrace it, um, rather than try to, to shy away from it or, or, or want it to go away. It's a very paradoxical um, journey in, in, in many senses, right? Yet, yet the, uh, the result of that, right? And, and again, I caution saying that, that this process is ongoing, right? It's, it's never a fixed point in time, but the, the depth and the perspective that we can achieve on life, um, when we're able to resolve these experiences, uh, that is in that journey, right? That is what makes it worth it in the end. Sure. <laughs> Existential question. And, uh, you know, this may still be a work in progress, but after going through all this, what now gives your life meaning? What, what is the meaning behind everything you've been through? Well, you, you know, I, 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 you're, you're right. It, it is an ongoing question. <clears throat> um, but what I would say has driven me more than anything and continues to drive me is uh, the the experiences we endure, right, essentially broaden our emotional ba bandwidth, right? They broaden our emotional playing field. And when we're able to experience the extremes of what life can offer, you know, whether that's happiness or sadness, whether that's tragedy or triumph, right? It gives us the capacity to empathize with others on a much greater scale, right? It gives us the capacity to help and influence others along their journey as well. So, so I, I really believe that, um, you know, human beings are meant to be social and, it, it, you know, the, the greatest meaning in life for me is the capacity to, uh, help and influence others along this journey, right? Uh, again, with the humility and understanding, that, that I'm, I'm still on this journey myself. <laughs> right. Right. It, it, you know, we, we can think of, uh, you know, if you, if you look at like the world of cycling, for example, you know, Tour de France type stuff. If, if, if you ever watch those guys, if, you, if you're familiar with that world, there's this thing called drafting, right. Where, where uh, if you and I are cycling and when we're doing like a hundred mile bike ride, if, if I'm in front of you just by an inch or two, right. And you're trailing my wheel you're essentially going to be catching my draft just like a race car, right? I'm blocking the majority of the wind and essentially pulling you along a little bit to make the journey a little easier. If I'm too far ahead of you, you won't catch that draft. And certainly if we're side by side of each other, we're both going to be going through the same level of adversity, right? So, so what I'm saying is if, if, if we have the capacity to be just slightly farther along, that then some people, right. We also then have the capacity to help draft them along. Right. And, and move forward as a species, uh, to participate, uh, in the, the unfolding of, of life and everything that's happening. Right. We, we, we all have our points where we need to lead and, and follow. Right. And, uh, we, we don't necessarily know, uh, what the end state of this game called life is. Right. But, but, there, there's a certain uh, there's a certain allurement that keeps us going, that keeps us moving forward, right? And uh, that ultimately takes blind faith uh, to believe that it is worth it and hope. Josh, after all the years, I'm sure you've uh, done everything possible to meet everybody along the way who helped save your life. I know we talked about the big guy. You know, you didn't even mention kind of uh, that first interaction. We kind of got sidetracked a little bit, but. 
Um, obviously, you express gratitude for them, but uh, you know, do, what are those? When, what were those encounters like for you? Were they, you know, helpful, liberating? You know, give me give me some of the emotions that go with all that. Yeah, uh, you know, maybe the best example I can point to is going back to Baghdad um, so soon, right? Something we said earlier is that trauma does not discriminate. And and a lot of people, for example, don't think about ER teams. They don't think about trauma units and what they're experiencing, right? That that trauma unit, uh, for example, treated over 350 severe trauma cases in the span of that one-year deployment. You know, that's 350 cases just like mine. Uh, And and in the case of a trauma unit, they they typically will pull off a miracle – Right. Uh, they'll, they'll, and then they send the person along to the next echelon of care, never to hear from them again. Right. Uh, their job is to stabilize and move to the next echelon of care. The impact that that has on the members of the trauma unit is profound. Right. But, but because it plants the seeds for these destructive questions of I should have, I could have, I would have. Right. Did the person survive? Did I do the right thing? Right. This sets us into the trap of a phenomenon called hindsight bias. Right. Essentially applying the information we know now to the information we had in the past. And, um, you know, so so bottom line is to go back and to actually thank that team in the flesh and blood validated their experience. Right. It validated their work. (laughs) And um, I've I've never been more. I mean, arguably, never been more captivated by an experience than going back and just saying thank you uh, to that trauma team. That 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 is one thing that made that entire process of going back to Baghdad worth it. Sure, yeah, that 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 much I can, you know, again to to put names with faces and everything else, and and you know, uh, retrace those steps to that point. I, I think there's a certain catharsis to it. Obviously, you would know better than I would, but it, from what you say, it, it makes a whole lot of sense that getting back there to thank them was a big part of it. All right. So obviously a military career ends and you go forward and, and now your mission in life is to change the life of others. Uh, you developed asymmetric mind, the company that you have out there, you do inspirational speaking and, and everything else and helping veterans kind of give me what asymmetric mind is all about and, and what you guys are up to. Yeah. So I, you know, after <clears throat> getting out of the mill, I got out of the military in 2014. Um, I, Honestly, not by choice. I got I got medically retired. Uh, ironically, not just because of the gunshot wound, but uh, because of a, a pretty extreme flare up of Crohn's disease, oh, which wow. is an in, incurable immune disorder. Um, so again, you know, from the trauma side, I've got a ton of perspective uh, or, or empathy, I should say, with people who have incurable diseases, cancer, whatever it may be. Uh, we lose our life, we lose everything, or it can feel that way. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you again that, that I, going through the process of getting shot and, and dying was, was much easier for me uh, than living with the perpetual threat of Crohn's disease. Um, that being said, uh, I spent some time in the private sectors at a variety of different companies um, and then ultimately split off to, uh, you know, do what I'm doing now with Asymmetric Mind. I basically learned that I, I feel that the the area where I can have the biggest impact uh, is one, you know, it's through this inspirational speaking, right? It, giving people permission and the validation needed to um, overcome their own experiences in their own ways, right? It, it, it's certainly one facet of that. Um, the second facet of, of what I'm doing is, is uh, with military and first responders uh, and the behavioral health clinicians who work with them. I'm actually training behavioral health clinicians in advanced cultural context of what these professions are, right? To 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 heighten their therapeutic ability, and then third, taking some some of those same principles that we have derived from this asymmetrical warfare environment, and applying it to leadership development and employee engagement strategies uh, for corporations. Uh, so again, you know, asymmetric warfare is all about empathy, humility, relationship building, all of the foundational traits that drive exceptional leaders, right? And and we're actually able to take that, overlay it with the psychology of human behavior, and inject it into these corporate environments to really make uh, an impact, right? Uh, so so in short, right, all of these experiences kind of infused together to do what I'm doing right now, 
um, which is, you know, again, giving this emotional flavor uh, to to leadership, which is, um, you know, it's it's an extremely difficult thing to convey. But once we're able to harness it, it can really unlock the potential of uh, that innate leadership potential within each one of us. Yeah, it's great. And I'm listening. Um, what you've created and what you've gone through absolutely um, are a testament to, you know, the experience. And, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, what when you look back on all this, what really is the over prevailing, overarching kind of feeling that you have? And, and and is that something that sticks with you every day or do you try to move past that? And, and you know, as you say, live a new life. <laughs> The feeling is mystery, feeling is ambiguity, right? It's, it's, it's all in, in some cases, right? Um, you know, maybe the, the, (laughs) the greatest sign maybe uh, of our emotional health is the acknowledgement of its ambiguous nature, right? That, 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 um, the, the biggest mistakes that I've made in the past Right. The the places where I put myself in the most dangerous position psychologically, again, with all the best of intentions, have been when I thought I have this beat. Right. I figured it out. And 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 certainly the the universe will come back around and slap you around enough until you finally get the hint. Right. And the the, the point is that hint was right. Uh, This this word surrender right at the deepest level. It's. um, that doesn't mean just sit back and relax, but it, but it means that, um, uh, the, the, the ability to essentially be comfortable, not knowing, right. Um, it is, which is a very difficult thing to do, especially when we are grounded in a sense of purpose and sacrifice, right. And, and uh, kind of want to latch onto things, but, um, th- that is the challenge, right? Being, being essentially comfortable in the state of ambiguity and, and, and trusting in the, in the core of who we are, right. In order to move forward. So, so I'd say the biggest sense is, is, is this sense of mystery, right? It's not that far of a stretch, right? I, I've said before that traumatic experiences, right? Extreme adversity, leaves us trapped in the past, right? It leaves us physiologically, emotionally, mentally trapped in the past, right? Creativity is really the inverse of trauma, right? So if, if we can disrupt the way we think about the past and learn to create again, right? Learn to innovate again. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not just talking about creativity and innovation in terms of a corporate environment. I, I, I mean it in terms of life in general. Right? Uh, can we can we re-spark, right? Reinvigorate the sense of hope um, that 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 life has to offer, right? And, and I'm I'm not claiming to have <laughs> nailed that completely, right? I, I, again, it's a journey; it's a never fixed point in time. But coming to that realization has allowed me to operate within those ambiguous states um, with much less personal destruction. Well, and that's, you know, look, obviously the goal and uh, for everything you've gone through, Josh, you, you, uh, it, it's a testament just to the fortitude and, and the will to keep progressing forward and, and moving forward in your own life. And for those uh, listening again, you can hear more about Josh's story in the book called The Beauty of a Darker Soul. Uh, certainly, again, check out Asymmetric Mind, one word, asymmetricmind.com on the web if you want more uh, from Josh and his company and what he has going on. But I, I can't thank you enough. It's honestly, I mean, incredible doesn't encapsulate the story, but uh, it, it's just to be brief. That's It's just the word that comes to mind. And I, I'm, I'm thankful that you're still here. I, I'm grateful that you gave us the time to do this. And I certainly know that you're appreciative of of the second chance at life that you've gotten. And uh, what, what more can we say, man? Just thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Hey, likewise, Mario. It was great talking to you and, uh, and all your audience members. Josh Mance, thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. We appreciate it, brother. I appreciate it. Take care. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.